The communist leaders, surprised by the Saigon army's disintegration, now moved swiftly. They set a deadline. Victory before the rainy season bogged down their troops. Dung's forces closed in on Da Nang. The BBC and VOA broadcasts said that Da Nang was about to fall. And that news further spread panic among us soldiers. Our officers had fled. We talked things over among ourselves and then decided, let's go home. By March 21st, 100,000 refugees, many of them troops and their families, had crowded into Da Nang. Some soldiers put their wives and children aboard ships headed for safer areas in the south. Many failed to get out. Soldiers here are confused. Um, as you walk down the street, you'll see soldiers with no shoes, so just staring into space. Um, there's a, I think, I think this panic is a word that describes very well what's happening in Da Nang. We've heard that a plane ticket now to Saigon is over 100,000 piastres if you can afford it. And of course that means that the rich leave and they take all their belongings. None of the civilian and military planes could land at the Da Nang airport because every time they approached, crowds chased after them in jeeps or motor scooters, trying to get on the planes and go to Saigon. A World Airways jet with company president Ed Daly aboard made a perilous landing at Da Nang. Daly was flying one last rescue mission against official American advice. He wanted to save women and children first, but desperate soldiers jammed into the airplane. They scrambled into the baggage compartment and clung to the stairway as the plane took off. It was the last American flight out of Da Nang. On the 30th of March, General Zung's forces captured Da Nang, sweeping across the vast air base where the first U.S. ground forces had landed in 1965. For one of his military camera team, Da Nang was home. I arrived there on the 31st, the day after liberation. Along the road, I saw many corpses of Saigon troops. Their Their weapons and uniforms, which they had stripped off, were strewn all over the place. As we entered the city of Da Nang, we encountered a group of disbanded Saigon soldiers. They had been hiding in a graveyard, and they stood up to surrender to us. When I found my family, I saw my mother for the first time in 20 years. Before we could say a single word, we embraced each other and wept. During the conversations with my family, I learned that all my nephews had become Saigon soldiers. Many Vietnamese families had members fighting on both sides. Now, some were reunited for the first time in decades. Offshore, refugees from Da Nang were packed aboard rescue ships. Thousands drowned trying to flee or were suffocated in the crush. As Tu's army crumbled, the hysteria spread south. Confusion spread even further in the army when rumors multiplied that Vietnam would be again partitioned. Soldiers couldn't, they couldn't understand why ships were being sent to central Vietnam to evacuate their families. If there was going to be another partition, why should they continue to fight? And why should they leave their families stranded out there?
cha mẹ vợ con họ mày đó học kiếm President Tu, still believing that America would not abandon him, again pleaded for help. On April 2nd, he met with Ambassador Martin and President Ford's special envoy, General Frederick Wyand. Wyand promised to recommend more aid, but by now, the Americans were losing faith in Tu. Wyand reported to Kissinger and Ford at Palm Springs. They concluded that a military deadlock was their best hope. Even if only part of South Vietnam could be defended, the communists might agree to a political deal with or without Tu. General Wyand came back and recommended uh, $722 million in additional military aid and assistance to make sure that the South Vietnamese would have adequate military hardware to create the stalemate. I was always hopeful that we're could be a negotiated settlement, even at that late date in March and April of 1975. Ford again asked Congress for aid, but members of Congress suspected a maneuver to blame them for the impending disaster. They rejected his request. We've sent, so to speak, battleship after battleship, and bomber after bomber, and 500,000 and more men, and billions and billions of dollars. If billions and billions didn't do at a time when we had all our men there, how can 722 million save the day? Can the South Vietnamese government, under President Thieu, or under any other leader, whatever the South Vietnamese decide among themselves, handle this situation? Well, I think the test is that they have handled it. And I think the government can handle it in the future, can become self-sufficient can keep their freedom and allow us, when we end our involvement here, to withdraw, as I think we should, leaving South Vietnam economically viable, militarily capable of defending itself with its own manpower, and free to choose its own government, its own leaders, as its people themselves may freely determine. This is a goal which is easily within our reach. It seemed to me there was no question that the South what was left of the South was in imminent jeopardy and that there was no way of, of regaining the northern half of the country. Well, Martin wouldn't believe it. And uh, Martin held to this optimistic view of the military situation almost to the end. And this was one of the problems in his approach to the evacuation question. Tu imposed a curfew in Saigon. American civilians began to pack up. Outgoing commercial flights were jammed, but the U.S. mission refused to disclose its evacuation plans, either for Americans or for Vietnamese who might be special targets for the communists. We had to fear that if we evacuated too rapidly, the South Vietnamese government in its frustration might turn on us and there might be a massacre of Americans. Uh, secondly, we wanted to withdraw at a measured pace so that the North Vietnamese would be concerned that if they move too fast, uh, we might intervene in order to save uh, the remaining Americans. On April 11th, U.S. carriers dispatched Marines on another evacuation mission to get the last Americans out of neighboring Cambodia. Communist insurgents were poised to take Phnom Penh, its capital. Despite the defeat in Cambodia, the United States still hoped to hang on in Saigon. We assembled a large fleet of South Vietnam for evacuation purposes. And I attempted a rather forlorn attempt, a rather forlorn negotiation to ease the transition. By